Sure. So one of the cases I guess I have to mention is a case called State versus Apprendi, kind of a technical criminal case, but I was a dissenter, and uh, it turned out that the United States Supreme Court reversed my court and agreed with my dissent. So that's what I have to remember. And of course, my dear friend and colleague, Justice O'Hearn, wrote the majority opinion, so we had a lot of laughs about it. But it was a, a simple case. We had a statute in New Jersey that said that if you committed a criminal act and you were motivated by a racial intent, a racial hostility, that you were sentenced as if the crime you committed was a crime one degree more serious than the crime you actually committed. And so in Apprendi, a guy had fired shots at a house occupied by a black family. And uh, the jury convicted him. And if I remember correctly, it was a second degree offense. And the judge, relying on the statute, made a factual finding not the jury, but the judge, after the jury convicted him, the judge found as a fact that he had fired the shots because he was motivated by a hostility to black people. And so the judge sentenced him to a sentence appropriate for a crime one degree more serious than the crime that he was convicted of by the jury. And the sentence was challenged by his lawyer in our court, and the lawyer argued that it was improper for the judge to sentence him as if he had committed a crime one degree higher because the factual finding that was the predicate for that sentence that he was motivated by race, was found by the judge and not by the jury. And the lawyer argued that as a matter of due process, any factual element that had the capacity to enhance his sentence had to be found by the jury and not the judge. My court disagreed. I wrote a dissenting opinion, joined by Justice Handler, and uh, the United States Supreme Court agreed with my opinion. I forget the vote in the United States Supreme Court, but that was kind of an unusual experience. Uh, now, um, I know in other levels of the court, having a decision reversed uh, is, you know, considered very adverse to your career. How was how that taken on this level? I mean, Oh, my goodness. Yeah. In all the years I was on the court, it might have happened one other time. I mean, mm -hmm. it, there weren't that many of our cases that went to the United States Supreme Court. And in that case, you know, Justice O'Hearn was not alone. He had four colleagues who agreed with him. Mm -hmm. So it was simply the U.S. Supreme Court saw the issue differently. It was a close case, and, and prior Supreme Court decisions had not resolved whether or not the fact of racial motivation was an issue that had to be decided by a jury and not a judge. Another dissent that I was proud of had to do with uh, a law called Megan's Law, which arose from the uh, death penalty conviction of the murderer of Megan Conka, and Megan's Law was the law that required sex offenders to register and that restricted their activities and restricted where they lived, and I felt that the 
when the when the law was challenged and it came to our court one of the issues was whether the law was what we call an ex post facto law that is a law that increased the punishment but applied retroactively to people who committed their crimes before the law had been passed and my dissent was on the basis that I thought that Megan's law was an ex post facto law and uh, no member of the court agreed with me the vote was six to one the New York Times was very kind and wrote an editorial complimenting my dissent but that was the only uh, that was the only corroboration I got for that dissenting opinion, but I thought it was the right thing to do. It was not a popular dissent when I wrote it, but I thought it was correct. Uh, another case that I've never forgotten uh, had to do with uh, a big piece of parkland in New Jersey that had a dam on it. and. A husband and wife with the last name of Troth were fishing in the water that led to the spillway over the dam and uh, it had rained for several days before they went fishing and the state had bought the whole piece of property with the dam and with the lake. When they bought the property the state received an engineer's report that advised the state that the spillway was narrow and that because it was narrow when there were heavy rains the flow of water leading over the spillway was such that it could pose a hazard to fishermen. Anyhow, the troths were fishing, uh, their boat got caught in the current near the spillway, they tried to start the motor and reverse the uh, course of the boat but they couldn't the boat went over the spillway and Mr. Troth was killed the family the executor of the state sued the state under the Tort Claims Act and the state defended on the ground that the state was immune from injuries caused as a result of unimproved property the state argued that the dam and the spillway and the lake were unimproved property because the state had bought it as it is. And at the conference after the oral argument, the vote was six to one against the troths. And I was the one, and I said, you know, <laughs> I don't know how you can call a dam unimproved property. Somebody had to build the dam. And in this case, they built it with a spillway that was too narrow and the state knew about it. So I don't agree. So the opinion was assigned to Justice Pollack for the majority and the dissent was assigned to me. I think I circulated my dissent before Justice Pollack circulated the majority, but maybe not. I don't remember. All I know is we didn't finish the opinion before I left for the summer and went up to Martha's Vineyard where I have a summer home. After I circulated my dissent, Justice O'Hearn called me up and said, you know what, I'm switching my vote. I said, thanks, Dan. So it's five to two. And then a week or so later, Justice Handler called and said, Gary, I'm gonna switch my vote, I'm with you. So it was four to three. So I hadn't heard from Chief Justice Wilentz after I circulated my dissent. So I called him and I said, Chief, have you read my dissent? He said, no, not yet. I said, do me a favor and read it. Another week went by, hadn't read it. I called him again. I'm, I'm going to get to it. Right around then, <clears throat> the New York Times wrote an editorial to acknowledge the 100th anniversary of the Johnstown Flood. The Johnstown Flood resulted in the collapse of a dam in Johnstown, Pennsylvania that killed 10,000 people. 
because the 80-acre lake that was held up by the dam, all of the water from that lake unleashed and the current and the volume of water was so strong it picked up railroad cars. It demolished factories. It just destroyed everything in its wake. It was one of the great tragedies. And so the 100th anniversary, maybe the Johnstown flood would have been 1898, something like that. I forget when I wrote Troth, but whatever it was, 1989, so it must have been 1889. So the Times, in its editorial commemorating the 100th anniversary, quoted from the editorial written in the Johnstown, Pennsylvania paper right after the flood. And that editorial in the Johnstown, Pennsylvania paper said, this was not an act of God. I, I got to explain. The, the, the dam in the Johnstown case was made of timbers. And there had been warnings published in the paper, in the Johnstown paper, that the timbers were rotting. And that the dam was hazardous. And so when the Johnstown paper wrote its editorial, it said this was not an act of God, this was an act of man. The analogy being that this was not unimproved property, this was something that man had done, and the analogy applied to our case. So I called Chief Justice Valencia, I said, do me a favor, read my dissent, and now read the editorial in the New York Times about the Johnstown flood and tell me how you're going to vote. And he called back and switched his vote. So my dissent became the majority in Troth, which was kind of satisfying. Um, was that unusual for... Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, very un later? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Very unusual. Didn't happen often. Uh, I can't uh, see from this list, Sean any others. There were, you know, there was a case came out of Jackson Township where a landfill had leached and destroyed the water supply in Jackson Township and a bunch of families sued and it was a tragic situation because they no longer had access to their well water and the township had to provide them with barrels and fill the barrels with fresh water every day so they could cook and shower. And the families sued and they wanted damages because they believed that they had consumed this contaminated water. There were several people in the township that had gotten sick and they wanted to be compensated for what they described as an enhanced risk of cancer. And writing for the court, I held that they couldn't be compensated for an enhanced risk of cancer, that, you know, if they got cancer, that would be a time for them to make the claim based on that, but that they were entitled to a very novel remedy which we called medical monitoring. And what we said was that the township and its insurance company had to pay for these folks to have an annual physical exam to make sure that they didn't contract cancer. And we felt that the cost of the medical monitoring was a fair cost to be imposed on the defendants because these families were genuinely panicked about whether their health had been permanently affected uh, by the township's failure uh, to properly close up that landfill and prevent the waste material from leaching into the water supply. So I thought that was one of the more important opinions uh, that I had written. 
there were a lot of them, but I, I can't remember any others. Uh, and I guess one of my probably best recognized opinions is State versus Novembrino. It's a Fourth Amendment opinion, and it had to do whether or not New Jersey would follow the United States Supreme Court and exclude evidence that had been acquired by a police department without a proper warrant, but in cases where the officer acted in good faith, believing that the search was lawful, just that the cop was wrong. The case involved what they called the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. The United States Supreme Court in a case called State versus Leon held under the Fourth Amendment that if an officer in good faith illegally acquires evidence that would have been excluded under the Fourth Amendment, the fact that the officer acted in good faith authorized the court to admit the evidence. And the question in Novembrino was whether New Jersey would follow the United States Supreme Court and apply the good faith exception to the exclusionary rule. I wrote for the court and said we would not apply the exception that whether or not the evidence was acquired in good faith didn't matter, that the purpose of the exclusionary rule was to protect American citizens against the use of unlawfully seized evidence, good faith or not. And the court divided six to one. I think Justice Garibaldi wrote the only dissent. But that was perhaps one of my most remembered opinions. I wrote it early in my career. I was happy when Chief Justice Wilentz assigned it to me. He was probably surprised uh, that that was the way I voted, but I think that's probably why I got the opinion. But anyhow, it was, uh, it was great fun. They were hard to write. Some of the opinions were very difficult. I remember I had to write an opinion reversing the death sentence of Teddy Rose a guy who killed an Irvington cop in Irvington Center with a sawed-off shotgun. It was hard because Irvington was my hometown and the killing was in cold blood. Uh, on the other hand, the prosecutor had committed prosecutor, prosecutorial misconduct in the way he summed up to the jury and it was clear as a bell that the death sentence couldn't stand. And so I remember struggling writing that opinion, one of my last opinions of the term, uh, and sitting in my chambers on a Saturday night grappling with how I would explain this opinion to the good people of Irvington. But, you know, some were harder than others. Now, um, did any of these cases generate, uh, um, I mean, they all generated public interest, but public backlash or, you know, like, things like hate mail, threats, uh, or did you ever feel any of that? No, no. The only case that generated that kind of activity was the right to die cases. There mm -hmm. were telegrams from members of the clergy, from members of the legislator, le legislature, urging us not to allow uh, nutrition to be shut off in the Job's case. I do remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but none, you know, we... We, we, got, we got extensive public criticism in the school funding cases because many legislators, many mayors, many elected officials didn't like what we were doing, that we were taking money that was tax money coming from suburban residents and applying it to help poor city kids. <clears throat> but that's... that's part of the game, part, 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 part of the business. We, we anticipated that kind of criticism. I will say this, the press in New Jersey has always been very supportive of our court, <coughs> especially in tough cases like that, especially in the school funding cases, in the right to die cases, in the affordable housing cases. The New Jersey media and their editorial pages were always very strong and very supportive. And uh, 
the members of the court were grateful for that. Uh, judges read the newspapers, mm -hmm. and it's not that we are guided by what they say, but it's reassuring when after we decide a controversial case, we get broad press support uh, for the decision we make. And that's one of the reasons why when we write opinions, we write them very carefully, very methodically, very thoroughly. We want the public to understand what we're doing. And the way for the public to understand is for the press to read them and then write about them in a way that the public can appreciate and and, and understand. Yeah, uh, you spoke earlier about uh, Justice Wilentz uh, and his style. Uh, <coughs> what are your thoughts on uh, Justice Poritz's uh, style as Chief Justice? Chief Justice Poritz was a very collegial Chief Justice. Uh, she uh, had served in state government as Attorney General and uh, she led the court in a very uh, effective and I think uh, successful way. Uh, she had the same uh, skill set uh, to be sensitive to the individual members of the court, to bring the members of the court together to try to reach consensus. Um, and uh, I don't know how long we served together <clears throat> because I left in 2002, maybe six or seven years though, mm -hmm. but I thought she was a very successful Chief Justice and did, did wonderful work for the court. As you noted earlier, you became very friendly with all of your colleagues. Uh, I did. In particular, um, you know, we've seen the pictures of you and Justice Clifford. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the pictures on the wall are from my 60-mile bike ride on my 60th birthday and my 65-mile bike ride on my 65th birthday. I took the ride with several of my children, some of my law clerks, and Justice Clifford, who was seven years older than I was, went on both rides. Uh, I think I've got that right. I think he was only seven years older. I may be wrong. He may have been nine years older. I don't want to be unfair to him. But he uh, joined us. We had uh, designed a route starting at my home in Upper Saddle River throughout Bergen County, up into New York State and back again. Probably took us six or seven hours both times a little longer for the 65 mile bike ride. We had uh, four or five pit stops on the way with friends who opened up their homes, let us use their facilities, gave us drinks and bananas for potassium and whatever else we needed. And uh, Justice Clifford did both rides start to finish. I think at the end of the 60 mile ride, my late wife Ed had made half a dozen lasagnas for the riders because there were a lot of riders and a lot of hungry guys. I specifically remember the 65 mile bike ride because we were in the last stages on West Saddle River Road and I was riding a bike with, uh, with clips, bike clips for my shoes. So I was clipped in and I got a terrible cramp in one of my legs. I had to jump off the bike and get out of the clips and I was just writhing in pain on the ground. <laughs> Clifford stopped. What's, what's the matter with you? And I explained I had a cramp so he hung out with me while everybody else was going past us. And we did the last two miles together very slowly uh, I did not ride up my driveway, which is 800 feet long and kind of steep, but he did. I walked the bike up the driveway, uh, but uh, I remember being very grateful for his friendship and company on the last leg of that trip. Uh, so 
uh, we took some pictures and I thought they'd be good to hang. And next to the pictures of the bike riders is a picture of a bicycle that Justice Clifford gave me when he retired. He said it had hung in his office while he was a judge. He was the guy that actually suggested to me that I take up bike riding. Mm -hmm. And I've been riding now probably, oh, since I joined the court in 85, uh, since at least uh, 87, so it's 30 years. And I still ride up at Martha's Vineyard in the summer. I try to do 15 miles a day on the days I don't play tennis. Mm. Uh, but I've always been grateful for Justice Clifford for getting me on a bike, and we have very happy memories together uh, of those rides. They were great. They mm. were just great. Yep. Well, um, tell me about uh, your decision to leave the court. Sure. Uh, the state constitution requires that judges retire at age 70. And in... I would have been 70 in uh, June of 2003. And because my son Mike had started this law firm where we're sitting here today called Pashman Stein, he started it with Louis Pashman, whose father, Morris Pashman, had served on the New Jersey Supreme Court before I got there. Morris Pashman had been a distinguished mayor of Passaic and Superior Court judge, the assignment judge in Bergen County, and then went on to the Supreme Court. And Mike and Lewis formed the firm. Justice Pashman was part of the firm when it opened. Um, so it was a small firm just finding its sea legs. And in 2001, when, uh, well, I actually made the decision to retire in 2002, but I made it five or six months early. And I decided that September 2002 would be a cutoff. I was about nine months before retirement. But it just seemed to me to be the right time. I just felt that I had been there a long time, time to make room for somebody else. And uh, it would give me a chance to join Mike and help him build this law firm. As I said, I was the seventh lawyer. Today we have, I think, about 45 lawyers, so the firm has grown significantly. And it's just a joy to me. I'm very close to all five of my kids. I see uh, the four that are on the East Coast all the time regularly and the grandkids that are around but I get to see Mike every day and that's a special joy because we share a deep interest in the law in the public interest side of the law our law firm has three members of the board of trustees of the American Civil Liberties Union in New Jersey and we do a lot of pro bono work for the ACLU for the Education Law Center and uh, it's just a delight to be practicing law with my son, to have him sign my paycheck so I'm getting even with him. And it's just a nice place to be. I love the court. It was truly the highlight of my professional life. It was a, a wonderful experience. I have told Governor Kane how personally grateful I am and always will be to him for giving me the opportunity to serve on the court. And uh, I'm deeply appreciative of that opportunity. <clears throat> I love the time I spent there, but I've been very happy since I left and I consider myself very lucky to be able to be practicing law with my son, to be living near my children and grandchildren and to have uh, a wonderful companion. Her name is Alice Olick. She's the lady that told my late wife that I should run for mayor. Mm -hmm. And we were both widowed at around the same time, so we spend time together. And so I consider myself blessed. And I was on the tennis court at 6.45 this morning playing singles. And I don't know how long that's going to continue, but I'm grateful for every time I can get out there to do that. That's one of the 
joys of my life. So I consider myself a very lucky man. Uh, any other memories of the your time in the court that you want to share? Uh, yeah, just one little touch. Mm-hmm. When Chief Justice Wilentz was leading the court, we had a little ceremony on the last day of the term. And it was just very sweet and very touching. He, uh, I think, lived the good life when he wasn't with us. And so he would bring in on the last day conference day of the term uh, a couple of tins of very good caviar and a couple of bottles of very good champagne Uh, I think I may have contributed to the champagne and the court would partake Uh, this was not our regular fare because our regular lunch fare was more like peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and tuna fish sandwiches Mm -hmm. but on the last day of the term we had this delightful moment where we'd share champagne and caviar and toast the court year. It was just a very sweet touch and one that I remember fondly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, um, you know, you've continued to be very active professionally uh, in the years since. Um, you you did make the news uh, a few years ago, uh, uh, reacting to some some of the issues surrounding, um, I'm forgetting the name of the justice, but it was either Chief, it was either Justice Wallace or Justice Holmes. Yeah, yeah, I think it was yeah. Holmes. Um, yeah. And do uh, you want to comment on that at all? Well, it was a very upsetting event because uh, Governor Christie was the first governor to refuse to reappoint a sitting justice of the New Jersey Supreme Court. And that was contrary to the constitutional intent. It was very clear from reading the minutes of the 1947 Constitution that the reason the Constitution was written the way it was, that justices would be appointed initially for seven years, and then upon good behavior for life until age 70. At that time, they thought that life ended at age 70. But the idea was that as long as you weren't uh, a drunk or a wife beater or some outrageous, had, had manifested some outrageous kind of behavior as a judge, that you would be reappointed. The reason for the seven year the seven-year initial appointment was to make sure (coughs) that you possessed the temperament and qualifications to be a judge. It was never intended to be a referendum on whether the governor in office at the time agreed with your opinions. That was the last thing that that the constitutional framers had in mind. It was simply, as a matter of fact, the original draft gave Supreme Court justices only one appointment, and that was till age 70. But then at the suggestion of Chief Justice Vanderbilt, it was changed to give us the same as the other judges, seven years, and then a reappointment till age 70. When Justice Wallace came up for reappointment, he had been a distinguished trial judge, excellent appellate division judge. He was the second African-American to serve on our court after Justice Coleman. He had an absolutely splendid record. And Governor Christie announced that he wouldn't reappoint him because he was dissatisfied with our court's opinion in the school funding cases, cases in which Justice Wallace had never participated. So it was crystal clear that his motivation was different, that he wanted to show his base or his constituents that he was appointing his own justices and was going to remake the court, which he thought was too liberal. I thought it was outrageous. I gave a speech at the Bergen County Bar Association uh, expressing my views. A few years later, when Governor Christie was running for re-election as governor, Justice Helen Holmes had come up for 
reappointment. Justice Holmes had been an outstanding trial judge, an outstanding appellate division judge. Her husband, Bob Schwanenberg, worked in the policy office of the Christie administration. And ironically, Justice Holmes, more than any other justice, in cases involving the governor's position on cases like um, the Council on Affordable Housing and school funding, Justice Holmes had voted in a manner consistent with the position that Governor Christie's administration had taken, consistently. She came up for reappointment and Governor Christie announced that he would not reappoint her because he wanted to protect her from an adverse adversarial confirmation hearing. He thought the Democrats were going to be hostile to her and he wanted to protect her and to protect her he would reappoint Justice Fernandez Vina uh, from Camden County who happened to be Latino uh, and just Governor Christie some said was anxious to appeal to the Latino vote. Uh, the grim effect of that decision was to reduce Justice Hone's pension on her retirement by over $60,000 a year. And ironically, we had a retirement dinner last night honoring Justice Holmes. Uh, I thought that was an outrageous, outrageously selfish decision on the part of the governor. I thought it was totally unjustified. His rationale that he wanted to protect Justice Holmes uh, rang hollow to my ears and to the ears of many other people who heard it. And uh, I thought it was cruel and uh, absolutely self-motivated. So uh, I have spoken out about perhaps amending the Constitution to make it crystal clear that reappointments are automatic absent some evidence of um, conduct absent some evidence of misconduct, put it that way. I suggested that uh, State Senate President Sweeney uh, said that he didn't agree with it and so he would not uh, permit it to be introduced. And so uh, even though the State Bar Association had endorsed the amendment, as had the New Jersey Law Journal, it hasn't gotten any traction. and. Maybe it won't be needed down the road because no governor has ever done what Governor Christie did, and I hope no governor after him ever does the same thing. It was destabilizing to the court, it was destabilizing to the judiciary, and it was demoralizing. And, you know, when lawyers agree to accept a judicial appointment, they have a right to assume when they give up their law practice uh, that they're not going to be denied tenure for reasons having nothing to do with their performance as judges, with their character, with the quality of their service. And in both these cases, these denials of reappointment seem to me to be completely unjustified and completely inconsistent with the spirit of the 1947 Constitution. That was why I felt so strongly about it. We have in New Jersey one of the best judiciaries in the entire country. And it's, a, it's an asset this state should treasure and preserve. And so future governors need to be careful not to take actions like that, that destabilize and demoralize the judiciary. We're lucky in New Jersey to have as good a judiciary as we do, and I hope we can keep it for many, many decades to come. All right. Um, so is there anything else you'd like to add uh, to this record now? Um, you know, th there's obviously many aspects of your life that we could go into. You, you have been working with the uh, Education Law Center, the... Um, I forget, what is the name of the group you were telling about it, us about on Monday? That it's a so, new organization yeah. called the New Jersey Coalition for Diverse and Inclusive Schools. I, I guess if there's one other thing I'd, I'd like to add, if I could, Sean, it's that 
Uh, my late wife and I were married for 47 years. We raised five kids and have all these grandchildren. And uh, When I was a young father and a young lawyer, uh, I was probably overcommitted to my legal career and uh, working very hard to learn and hone my skills as a lawyer. And uh, today, because of the blessings I enjoy with my five children and 16 grandchildren, I often think about uh, advice that my late wife Ed gave to me when I was a young, ambitious lawyer. And she took me by the collar one day and said, Gary, remember this, no matter what kind of success you achieve as a lawyer, if you don't succeed as a father, you're going to be a failure in life. And so you better make sure that you look after these kids with me. And I to this day think that was the best advice I've ever gotten. And that's why I said that the best decision I ever made was to marry her because together we built a very, very close family of five wonderful kids. My four daughters and Mike are close to each other. They love each other. They are in close communication. I speak to my kids uh, many times a week. And my 16 grandkids are very close. Many of them spend time at the Martha's Vineyard House in the summer. Several have jobs there now that they're older. And I feel an extra blessing because of this tremendous family I have around me. And I really feel I owe the good fortune I have to my wife's good advice when I was a young lawyer. and didn't really know what mattered. So I just wanted to add that. All right. Well, uh, I think that concludes today's session. Uh, we may come back for a follow-up, but um, uh, I want to thank you for today's interview. It's been fascinating to learn about your life. Uh, it's been a wonderful start to this uh, whole effort to, to document the lives of retired Supreme Court judges. and. Um, Thank you. I appreciate it. Sean, thank you very much. Right. Thank you for your time and for your thoughtful questions. And I've enjoyed the experience. And I'm so grateful to both Rutgers and the Administrative Office of the Courts for undertaking this project. I think it's going to be wonderful for uh, not only my colleagues and their families, but for the public and for lawyers and for people who want to study the workings of our court and our relationships. I think it's a wonderful project and thank you for letting me kick it off. Oh, thank you.